Welcome to a special Blue Gold Game edition of Irish Illustrated Overtime. I'm Tim O'Malley of Irish Illustrated, joined by Tim Priester, John Bryce of footballscoop.com. And guys, I didn't think about this during our Irish Illustrated instant analysis, but Chris Mitchell probably had a little bit of a treat coming over to uh, to South Bend for his first spring and winning the Blue Gold Game with a 62-yard touchdown. He won it with his route, a stop and go, and he said he and his good friend Steve Angeli had worked on that. They knew it was coming to him, and that proved to be the game winner in what was a well-played offensive game. It really was. I, I had, uh, in typical fashion, I predicted a low-scoring game, and it wasn't anything close to that, and Justin Fisher didn't come anywhere close to the end zone, uh, and he fumbled too. So uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm true to form with my predictions. But, yeah, it was it was kind of a quiet day for Chris Mitchell up until that point, and he did a double move on Isaiah Dunn, a, a, a walk-on quarterback, and Dunn bit. He won't. Will, he will not want to see the film of that because it was not pretty. But Chris Mitchell does that to people. He had 100 receptions at Florida International. And he's a good receiver, and they've got a bunch of good ones. Um, some of which didn't play today. Some of which did. Uh, Micah Gilbert came alive late and uh, was really good. I said it on instant analysis, and I think it's at least fairly accurate. Uh, you know, Jaden Greathouse was the early entry freshman last year that really shined during the spring and in the, the blue goal game. And, and uh, Micah Gilbert was that guy today. Eventually he started out a little bit slowly. Yeah. I think with uh, Micah Gilbert, you see a lot of promise there. You see what we've talked about the entire spring uh, among those rookies. He's the guy that stamped his arrival as ready to contribute in the 2024 season. Um, a nice day overall for the Irish. I think we continue to see, as we alluded to the uh, incident analysis after the game, this is a much more athletic team, a much deeper team on both sides of the football, and a lot of reasons to be excited about what we saw today from Notre Dame. In case you all, in case anybody watching missed or didn't catch all of the game, in addition to Chris Mitchell scoring a touchdown and Micah Gilbert scoring two, Aeneas Williams ran for one, Kenny Minchie ran for one, Eli Raritan scored the first touchdown on a juggling catch on a pass from Steve Angeli. And Jeremiah Love also scored a touchdown, though he had the highlight real play of the day on a long catch and run where he broke several tackles. It was the three quarterbacks is is what we're going to be talking about now for the next three months. As long as there are three quarterbacks, we'll be talking or as long as there's four quarterbacks, we're going to be talking about these three quarterbacks, along with Riley Leonard, who did not play. Kenny Minchie committed the only turnovers with an interception and a fumble. I want to point out, we did not bring this up. Kenny Minchie ran for five first downs, including a touchdown in this game. I do keep track of that during the game. That's that's a quality effort for him. He also threw a touchdown pass to Gilbert. And we can start with Minchie because right now he's the guy that's sandwiched on this roster between what people perceive as the future C.J. Carr, the present of Riley Leonard and Steve Angeli. And he's a talented quarterback that did not wear the red jersey today. He was allowed to just go play. Yeah, and, I, and I think he took advantage of it for the most part. Um, he did have the interception. Uh, at, pressured, by, pressured on the pick. He was pressured pretty. on the pick by Luke Telich and Ben Minnick could have could have picked him off uh, as well, and that would have been a pick six, which yeah. would have been two Saturdays, Saturdays in a row. But as you point out, Tim, he, uh, he, he ran really well. That's a key component of his game. And we even said before the game, since he was going to be live, he would he would benefit um, you know, from the ability to run, whereas last week they were all in red jerseys and yeah. and it's very difficult to tell, you know, who is going to be sacked and could they run uh, and, and gotten away. But I do want to, you mentioned uh, Jeremiah Love and the, the the great play of the day. You remember last Saturday, he ran over a down shooter. Right. So um, he's talked about being stronger. He's gotten stronger uh, since last year, which was definitely necessary as a freshman. And um, and he showed it again. So that's a really good sign. Of course, Jadarian Price didn't play today because of a, a hamstring injury. I know there were a lot of concerns about, um, you know, exactly why he missed the game. But uh, and we will talk about, it, as we mentioned in in instant analysis, you know, hamstring issues, because that was the reputation and that Lauren Lando had when he was with the Broncos. But as I said, then. And I stand by it now because, it, I mean, you can't just take a small sample size and say this is this is it. Hamstring injuries occur to football football players and track runners. And, um, you know, those guys are essentially track runners, runners. And as you said, JB, it was a it was a chilly day. It was a kind of day or a chilly week, I should say, and the kind of kind of week that you can pull a hamstring. I don't want to make excuses, but I also think that sometimes we chase ghosts and we see one little speck of evidence 
and declare it to be reality. Yeah, and, and look, if, if there are going to be some hamstring tweaks, let them be now rather than August or September. Um, and I think it, it, what stood out to me as we talked briefly about the strength element is how unsolicited everyone from, from Reno Montefort to Eric Goins to uh, wide receivers to Aiden Schuler to whomever, they've all talked about the impact of Lauren Lando and, and his staff and how much more explosive they all feel, how much more dynamic they feel, how he has tailored programs specifically to them. I talked to people over the course of the past week on campus um, who talked about how Marcus Freeman really prioritized diving into a new scientific element to, to sports science, I should say, uh, to really help this roster take the next step. And I'm not convinced that, that there was a belief that that was the path forward under the previous strength coach. So I think this is something that Marcus Freeman has invested in. I know he's meticulously studied the impact of sports science. I think there's great optimism around the program for the in, impact of Lauren Lando and his staff. And I think, again, I trust the players who have found ways – Again, they're not being coached to talk about Lauren Lando's impact, but they have all, to a person, from, from Jaden Thomas to whomever, talked about the impact of Lauren Lando. Uh, when we talk about Jeremiah Love today, um, after he had the truck stick move last week over Schuler, uh, he was really good on that catch and run today and broke, I, I think I counted five or six tackles that he broke on that one play today. And also Love has showcased his versatility throughout the spring with how much time he spent in the slot receiver position. I don't think that's something we've just been shown as eye candy. I think in talking to people, Jeremiah Love wants to prove he can play wide receiver, wants to prove that he can help this team at the slot position. I think his senior season of high school, he played almost entirely the wide receiver position. It's a passion project for him. And again, I just think this is a Notre Dame roster that has improved top to bottom to you. Steve Angeli's numbers were the best among the quarterbacks today. Uh, actually, he actually threw that pass to Jeremiah Love. I just had to look it up on the on the catch and run. So 228 yards passing and just under 100 of it was on the Jeremiah Love catch and run and throw deep to win the game to Chris Mitchell. But the final numbers of 17 to 25, two TDs and zero interceptions. We wanted to see zero interceptions from Steve Angeli. I think that's the key to Steve Angeli winning that reserve number two quarterback job, holding people off because – Kenny Minchie has dynamic legs, and we're told a tremendous arm. He didn't, we didn't really get to see him squeeze the ball into small places at all this spring like we were told he could do by quarterback coach Gino Gadouli. We saw C.J. Carr's arm. I say Steve Angeli was the winning quarterback. C.J. Carr couldn't win or, and had to lose, too, because he played for both teams. He threw for 165 yards, uh, 15 for 23, one touchdown, no picks. As Priester said in instant analysis, he could have been picked as well. Had a chance to win it at the end uh, with a drive down, but that drive stalled as well. Want to circle back to the five first downs I talked about for Minchie. Jeremiah Love tied him with five first downs, including a touchdown. Deion Colsey and Jabram Payne, four apiece. Micah Gilbert and Jaden Greathouse, three. And I think that leads into Priester saying he's this year's Jaden Greathouse, hopefully yeah. Micah Gilbert. We'll take those numbers without the hamstring strains. If he has those numbers as the seventh <laughs> receiver, someone got supplanted at four, five, and six, though. Yeah, and, he, and I want to say this about Carr. What, what his numbers were, fifteen for twenty-three. But there was, a, I know there was a, a, a pass to Jeremiah Love that I don't yeah. remember how much it was. It was double-digit yardage that was negated by was that the face mask hold by Ty Chan? It, 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 whatever it was, a, it was a, a penalty on the offensive line. I'm looking at this right now. He also had there was a drop by um, Cooper Flanagan on the first drive of the fourth quarter. And there was a great, a, a tremendous touch pass. Oh, inside, right snap to K.K. Smith. Inside the 10. And K, it, it really wasn't K.K. Smith's fault that he didn't make the play. It was a really tough play. He had already, he had already kind of leaped and was on his back and it hit him in his chest. And it, it kind of dislodged when his body hit the ground. But, I mean, you, you know, if you, if you throw those into his stats – CJ Carr, that is, it's, it's an even better day. And look, I am the last guy to overplay a, a freshman, an early entry freshman quarterback, because generally the masses want to anoint him right away. And that's just not how we generally do our work. We want to see what we see, what we see, and we evaluate it. And, and that's why, you know, the whole thought last week while he was going against third teamers, that's not the point. The point is, How's the ball come out of his hand? How quickly does it get to the receiver? And is it a catchable ball? The touchdown pass that he threw to Gilbert 
down in the uh, opposite corner from from us was just an, a, an absolute brilliant, perfectly thrown football, just like the one that I mentioned uh, to KK Smith that was dislodged when he hit the ground. And there, there was another throw that he made absolutely perfect across the field for a first down. I want to say today maybe it was on a third and twelve or something like that, and and he threw it just perfectly on a crosser that stretched all the way to the sideline and had to feather it in over the shoulder, and, and it worked. I also think it's worth noting, yes, he could have been picked. He was not picked. Two consecutive Saturdays he performed in Notre Dame Stadium without a turnover. More importantly, today in the for the first time ever in front of a, a sizable crowd, it was announced at 37,000. Some of those were disguised as empty bleachers. I was going to say, but, what? <laughs> yeah. so, no way. No, no on way. campus, yeah. Yeah, on you, campus. you, you got to respect the camouflage. But, yeah, um, right. you know – Here's what st- sticks out to me, though. He led a touchdown drive on his first possession today inside Notre Dame Stadium in front of a crowd. Yes, Aeneas Williams capped it off, cleaned it up with a run to cap that drive. But again, his first entry in front of a crowd, no nerves, commanded the offense very well, um, did some nice th- things, made some nice throws on that drive, and also was quick to celebrate when Aeneas Williams got in, burst into the end zone to celebrate with his fellow rookie teammate, um, which again is why I I continue to be very high on the work that Marcus Freeman and company have done to overhaul this roster and to completely um, elevate this roster, I should say, is a better term. Priester, you're about to go into a deep dive tomorrow night for the uh, Peacock film with the offensive line, but you knew going into the game the defensive line would have an edge because the defensive line goes three deep, rotates, and is used to rotating together. The offensive line does not like to split up in any sport or any team in the world. They were split today, and they did show better in one-on-one situation. There was none of the – none. I don't think there was a single miscommunication between the quarterbacks and the tackles in terms of letting someone free. Now the defensive line whipped some players at some point today. There were, there were seven sacks. There were some more stuffs. You do expect a guy like Jason Anye to dominate the third string and second string guards, and that's what he was doing. But they were one-on-one victories, too. I want to point out the near – I think it was the near interception by Minnick. That was pressure by R.J. Oban kind of casting Charles Jagasa aside for his second pressure of the quarter. Yeah, Oban, Oban whipped Jagasa that one time. I mean, that was that was a clean whipping. And, and when we say seven sacks, you know, understand there were, there were 67 passes. So. Yes, so it, it – more so, than usual. Yeah, I mean, you know, because you because you split things up and and all the quarterback throws count for you on both sides. Right. Uh, it's it's going to be a, a, a high number, an abnormal uh, number. But you know, I, I I think you still go into this and say, is Notre Dame still in the market for an offensive tackle? I, I don't know who that would be at this moment, or if you can do better than Charles Jagasaw. But ja- Charles Jagasaw is not a true pure left tackle. I think you're wanting to. Re- I think you're looking to replace the other side first, though. That's why I think you have to be okay. in the market for an offensive tackle. No, I mean, so either way, yeah, either way, and I and I don't know, you know, there aren't any other answers um, on, on the roster right now, so you have to, to look to that. Now, speaking of answers on the roster, that was one of the questions that I asked Marcus Freeman about in terms of a punter with Bryce McPherson out the door, and I said is. Do you have your punter on the roster to replace him, or do you have to go outside to get him? And he didn't, he didn't hesitate to to say that they have to go outside. Now I know that there's been talk about the Arkansas punter. His name is not on my lips right now that I can, or in my head that I can recall. But um, it's tampering anyway, right? So you yeah, well, that's yeah. Right. He, is is he 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 is in the portal? <laughs> no, I'm saying you can't say it. That's I, oh fine. yeah. Anyway, um, Marcus Freeman said it. They're looking for a punter. Um, and so I assume they'll go out and get one. You really don't have, you don't have really many good options. Uh, Mitch Jeter punted in high school. Uh, Chris Salerno is not a good option. Eric Goins, uh, I don't think is a, is the kind of option that you're looking for. Well, he, he, well, he, he came in as a, he came in as a kicker, right? Over punter. Yeah. No, he was a punter first. Oh, okay. He was a punter. Yeah, but I think he'll be, I think he'll be competing with someone this summer. Either way, either way, they're going out to get one. Yeah, and, and as we've discussed, of course, it would be nice if it was it was it was true cherry picking, and you could go out and say, "Oh well, we know a tackle is going to be in the portal, and we need a tackle, so we'll just go sign a tackle, and we'll right. just go sign a high quality punter." It, it's it's not that easy. And uh, in talking with people, it's expected to be um, 
as big a premium position, maybe more so than quarterback in the portal in this cycle because there's expected to be more quarterbacks in the portal than offensive tackles in the in the portal, particularly quality offensive tackles in the portal. So, um, you know, you hope for Notre Dame's sake that it can find a, a tackle in, in the portal should it choose to do so. I still think the odds don't particularly favor Notre Dame right. unless something uh, unexpected develops here. It's worth noting as of today, there's 10 days left in this spring portal open period, unless you're a graduate transfer. If you graduate in May, you can still go into the portal uh, and have your options in front of you. Well, plenty of time to talk about everybody's favorite new position, the linebackers, but I wrote these names down as guys that are not too deep competitors this year that had moments, more than one, in the blue gold game. And one name keeps popping up. So this is for the future probably, but Cole Mullins, Tim Priester, keeps showing well every time we watch practice. Kahanu Kia had a good day today. Bryce Young, who I think could work his way into anything. Uh, Devin Houston did share a sack with Kia. He was not credited for that for people that didn't see it live. Um, Sean Sevellano moves faster than anybody that looks like that in the world. He has quick feet. He's going to have to reshape his body to really to really contribute over the long haul. Ben Minnick flashed today after. I don't remember him doing anything in the jersey scrimmage, so it was good to see Ben Minnick out there. Preston Zinter, who Preacher's been high on, had a couple heavy hits today. Jabram Payne did go through him once for a first down on third down. And that is, and credit Eric Thomas, Noah, and Tom the intern, that is the best we have seen Micah Bell play. He had three passes defended because two were called back. That's bad luck for Micah Bell. And he also broke up the what would have been the game-extending drive on a pass from C.J. Carr to K.K. Smith. Huge flash by Micah Bell. He was a guy that I, early in the spring I said, you know, man, he's just not strong enough, and he probably still isn't, but he made plays today. Cole right. Mullins is 6'4", 244, and so that obviously is not ideal tackle uh, size, but he is tough. He finds a way to get off blocks. He's difficult to block. Um, a guy, Yeah, I mean, a guy for the future, but yeah. – you know, who knows if he's 260, eh, that's probably too much to ask by this fall. I, I don't know, but he, he really, he really showed, uh, really showed well. And that's why I say, you know, this was the last question of our podcast the other day about, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what should we expect or what are we looking for? Or, you know, what coming out of the blue gold game. And it's like, Hey, if we've, if we've mentioned them, we've seen it in the, in some of the practices and, or, the coaches have have recognized them for their contribution. So if the, if those are the guys that pop up, not to not to you discount. Well, for example, Michael Bell. Michael Bell made plays today. I don't think he's physically ready to to play a whole bunch, but noted. You know, I mean, it, it was a big is the biggest stage that he's been on in Notre Dame, and he made plays. And so you know, Cole Mullins is a name that has popped up. Zinter's a name that's that's popped up in the past. Um, when those guys start stacking them together, you know that they're being seen and doing some good things. And Deion Colsey. I should mention Deion Colsey was Deion Colsey. not a young name. Deion Colsey caught four passes. They all moved the chains. Three of them were on Christian Gray, and I think Colsey was the person that caught the pass that JB was referring to on the throw from CJ Carr on third down because he did convert for a third, for an 18-yarder. Boy, if we would have gone into the day saying what Eli Raritan did as opposed to us thinking he might not play – Eli Reardon's a pretty important player going forward, especially with Mitchell Evans still shelved. Now, if all three of those tight ends are healthy, the Notre Dame offense gets even better. It'll be interesting, the all the th different matchups Mike Denbrock can throw at teams with these receivers, the running backs. But it's great to see Eli Reardon out there. The only, As Priester said to me during the game, the only thing better than see Eli Reardon sitting out this game is for him to play the whole game and play well. And and to exit the game healthy, I, yes, I would argue yes. that yes. <laughs> even um, his his touchdown catch was sensational. I love the fact that he took on some contact, uh, absorbed some hits, plowed over a defensive back into the boundary at one point. Um, just a really fine day for Eli. Five catches on seven targets. Might have had an early drop, and then was really really good uh, from that point onward. Uh, again, you, you noted. Uh, what he could potentially bring to this to this offense uh, and NFL talent, especially if you get Mitchell Evans back and Kevin Ballman is any type of contributor. We continue to hear just how excited this entire program is about Flanagan. Uh, boy, it becomes quite tantalizing to think if you've got Rared and fully healthy, ready to go, Flanagan continuing his development, and then you can get a couple of those guys like Evans and, and Ballman back ready to contribute by August 31st, then 
you're back to being the tight end you that I think we all expect in Notre Dame. Uh, you know, Raritan, one of his drops was one of those change-ups that uh, Angeli threw. He didn't throw a bunch of them, but there were a couple balls. It's like, man, just just could could you just muscle up and and throw it? I don't know why some of those uh, some of those passes came off the hand the way uh, his hand the way they did. He he doesn't. I mean, who has his strongest arm on among the four? Riley Leonard. I, I I like I would have I would imagine that that is so. I but. Like when you watch Carr throw the ball, you don't say, wow, he's got a gun, but yet from release to arrival to the receiver, yeah. he might have the most efficient arm. Um, that might yeah, be the I best. Think from, I think from setup to ball hitting the receiver's hands, CJ Carr's pass gets there the fastest when he's dropping back to throw it. But I think maybe yeah, Riley Leonard muscling the ball might be, well, we hope so. <laughs> Yeah, and he's, he's, his running ability that would be a good thing because we played for 13 games. He's a longer athlete, and so right, you kind of you know you ball. kind of expect. I would imagine, you know, he's got a, a little bit longer arm swing. I would imagine when it comes uh, combine time, he's going to measure to have larger hands, which you know, in in baseball, um, you know, spin rate rotations, guys with with longer fingers can throw the ball. With more rotation, a little bit harder, and that probably applies to, to Riley Leonard as well. We have two questions on the board, and both are about Aeneas Williams, so I think we should switch to that. It was It's a hard day for the running backs because you're missing what we believe to be the lead guy in price. They use love in a double role, and you're missing Kedron Young, who, for who probably got set back a little bit going into his offseason by missing so much time in the spring because he was out – the second practice we went to that doesn't mean it was the second practice he was, yeah he was in action a couple weeks ago and i don't know if he had a re-injury or they just decided we're not we're not going to put him in the game it was pro- probably the latter but you know we know we know how stout and strong he can be too good day by aeneas williams though um as marcus freeman said he's flashed a lot they know he can run they know he can catch it all comes down to pass protection for the freshman i did not see his other 297 reps, but in the three reps I noted this spring, Aeneas Williams picked up three different blitzers, including Jay Nosberry and pass protection. So he could be a good player to help that running backs room because if you're playing 12, 13, 14 games, you're going to need more than Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love part time. Yeah. And perhaps I'm biased because I, I see what Dylan McCullough does so much and, and we've been around him so much. But, but Dylan McCullough, uh, I think is probably the best running backs coach in college football. He's up there alongside a Curtis Looper at Missouri, Carlos Lachlan, formerly of Oregon, now at Ohio State. But the dealing is really good. He's got that Super Bowl ring. The guys listen to him. He's got a method to his madness. I really love that about him. He's got a, a great, unique gift to have these guys buy into all their separate roles um, and at a position that wants one primary role, and that's 20-plus touches a game. So um, Aeneas Williams will benefit greatly from even more time with Dylan McCullough. I don't think you ever worry about Dylan McCullough getting a guy ready in all facets of the game, uh, encouraging there. And we know what he says about Kedron Young. He, uh, he already told us he's a grown man. That's basically a direct verbatim quote from what Dylan said maybe three weeks ago. So there's a lot of uh, excitement and interest there for what he can eventually bring to the running back group. But again, um, Notre Dame to, to Marcus Freeman's, credit, Chad Bowden's credit, all their credit once again. They're structuring and building a program, sustaining a program that you can sign some really talented guys but not have to um, make them critical for your immediate success. And and I think that's important not only for the the present term but for sustained and long-term success for the Notre Dame program. And one of our listeners, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name. It went by before I, I caught the name, but mentioned that Aeneas Williams has good size. He's listed at 5'10", 207, which is – for for early entry freshman, that's that's put together pretty good, pretty well at five foot ten. And Tim, you mentioned if if you're going to watch the blue gold game with an eye towards what you heard in the spring, we heard from people, we saw it for ourselves for the first time. We used to push back against the notion of Jalen Sneed had to get in the games. Now Jalen Sneed will be in the games. Jalen Sneed capitalized on his very good spring with a quality blue gold game. Pass defense, Tackle stuff. I like to mention those. Those are tackles for two or three yards when it's like an inefficient pass play. They gain two, three, four yards, but the defender's right on top of them, makes it third and six. He had two of those. He has been become a consistent player. He might be more consistent than he is flashing, which is the most important thing for Jalen Steve's game going forward. Yeah, he he and he again the way he's carrying himself now, he he knows. He he knows. 
you know, a lot of times, and everybody develops at a different rate. Coaches say that all the time, and it's absolutely true. I coached. I saw I saw it happen all the time, and and he just wasn't – I mean, I think Jalen Sneed will, you know, look back and say, you know what, I just wasn't ready. I just wasn't mature enough to be a quality player, you know, early on. The same way I wasn't mature enough to be a quality student at Notre Dame. <laughs> I, I needed to go to college when I was like 26, 27, 28 years old. I would have been a hell of a better student. And I, and I think, you know, Jalen Sneed is – but he sees it now, you know, and you're surrounded by guys that are getting ready for the draft. Um, and, and he sees it and he starts to understand it and he starts to feel it a little bit more. And he's uh, you're right, Tim, it's more than just flash. It's yeah. more than just flashing. Now it's a, a fairly consistent level of play. Well, and to, to that end, um, it's a consistent level of play. I would be curious to know, um, this, this would be a fascinating case study. Jalen Sneed was this highly regarded five-star prospect out of South Carolina. I wonder um, how often it, it takes maybe a five-star out of South Carolina a little longer to acclimate to the college game as opposed to a five-star out of Texas or Florida or Georgia, where the high school competition is so much better. Perhaps it's a, a slightly smoother transition. So I think you give Jalen Sneed a lot of credit, not only for what he's physically done this spring, but for the uh, emotional and mental maturity that we all know that he's possessed. And he has he has eligibility through the 2026 season. They re, he redshirted his freshman year. It didn't it never seemed like it to me during 2022, but he but he did, you know. So but, but, but if you're Notre Dame, yeah. oh, sorry, I was gonna say if you're Notre Dame, you hope he's not here in 26. I was gonna say two years of Jalen no, Steele. No, 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 very true. But my, my point saying that is he really yeah. is barely right. Yeah, yeah, he is very young here. Yeah, he you won't. If he right. on this path, he won't be here in 2026, and that's and that's, that's a good perfectly thing. fine. Perfectly yeah. fine. I'm going to hit you guys with some questions because we are concluding the blue goal game in our spring rack up. There's 10 position groups out there, nine if you wanted to put the uh, defensive backs together from practice one through practice 15 going the off season. Which one impressed you the most with a little bit element of surprise? In other words, you you could have liked them, but now you like them even more. You talking about freshmen? No, position group of team. The team oh, position groups. I'm sorry. Um, well, I mean, I think we all felt good about – we felt good about linebacker going in, but we feel really good about yeah. linebacker going in. And I think, um, you know, I mean, you guys have talked about safety, maybe a, a, a portal guy. I'm more cornerback when it comes to, you know, if you're going to go get a DB in the, in, in the portal. Um, uh, but you know, well, Jordan Clark, what did, did he didn't play much today, but he didn't, yeah, he didn't play much today, but I think we all, I know. never saw Jordan Clark in the game today, but I think a lot of guys do. I didn't see Jack Kaiser in the game either. It doesn't mean he wasn't out there for a play. He started, I think, but he? yeah, he probably was, wasn't out there. And so, no, that's good. I, I, I think, you know, if you include Clark with the safeties, although he really isn't, he's more of a nickel, but. Uh, you know, the development of, of uh, we've liked Schuler and the, and, and, and tell it's really flash today. So, so safety, I, I, safeties would be another one where you improved. I mean, yeah, I think so. I think so. For me, um, when, when you talk about you had high expectations or, or solid expectations and they exceeded those, um, I'd have to start with the wide receivers yeah, um, because, yes, they, they go and get a Mitchell from FIU but it's a wide receiver coming from FIU to Notre Dame. They go and get Jaden Harrison from Marshall, and, yeah, he was an elite punt or, or specialist returner, but he's coming from Marshall to Notre Dame. Um, and, and those guys, uh, Harrison looked great all spring until the plantar fasciitis. Mitchell obviously uh, became a star today. Uh, you still didn't have Bo Collins. You still didn't have uh, Faison most of the spring. You had Colsey miss some time with the – the finger injury, uh, and yet we never talked about how depleted the wide receivers were on any given day. We almost never talked about the receivers dropping a lot of passes in the early portion of practices that were open to anyone. So I had really high expectations for the linebackers. Uh, it's nice to see those uh, kind of verified and, and nice to see just how really athletic that group is. Again, that's that's an SEC linebacking core. That's, a, that's an athletic group of linebackers that can stack with anybody, I believe, in the country, particularly as they get the rest of the spring and summer under their belts and, and continue to grow, uh, particularly those younger guys. So the wide receivers for me, and then I've, I've got to be honest, it's the quarterback. And, and it's yeah. crazy to say that because we saw so very little of, of Riley Leonard, but 
CJ Carr so far exceeded expectations. It's so weird to think about um, where Notre Dame so desperately was early in the first season of, of Marcus Freeman oh. at the starting quarterback. <laughs> so now we all sit here and say it repeatedly. I said it in some analysis post game. They have four quarterbacks who could go win a lot of games on this schedule in the fall. Hey, I want to bring this up because I, I don't know why I brought this up pregame with Priester, but they were desperately overmatched against Marshall quarterback receiver versus corners. Think about that. They were wildly overmatched in that game between their quarterback wide receivers and Marshall's corners. And that's what part of the reason they lost the game. I am going to, before we finish on a negative note and I get the flip side question for you guys, <laughs> I want to say the defensive line for me, because I always liked the defensive line for the last seven or eight years. You could go three deep at strong side end. If Gabriel Rubio is back, you are going five deep at interior positions, nose tackle and defensive tackle. I think you're going two and a half. Maybe Tui Halamak is a good third at Viper. That is the and this does not count any of those redshirt freshmen and freshmen we talked about. You are not looking. Devin Houston doesn't have to perform, but maybe he could. Cole Mullins doesn't have to get on the field, but we keep seeing him flash. Sevillano is a couple years down the line, but he is quick in short space over five plays. I just think the defensive line can go forever. And in terms of you need Mills, Cross, Oban, Burnham, and Botello and Traore to win a playoff game, but you can beat plenty of teams without one of those guys out there. That's the type of depth I think they have on the defensive line. And to end on a negative, Tim Priester and John Bryce, I'd like to say the offensive line is going to be a work in progress, as Tim has noted, through September this season. Not as bad as 2021 when it was a wild work in progress, but I still think it's a work in progress through September. I do, I, I do, and I, but I think it, it's it's way more tackles than it is. Yes, in, in yes. Their O line. I mean, I think Billy Schroth is going to be good. Ashton Craig is going to be good, and I. Say it. You know, I've been, I, <laughs> I have, I've, I've been a defender of, of Pat Coogan, and I still think that he did a better job than most people give him credit for. But I think Rocco Spindler is going to beat him out. I and I and I haven't really felt that way. Maybe I haven't really felt that way till today. So uh, shame on me for using one one uh, scrimmage that I say doesn't you know mean as much as some other ones. But I but I but I, we're also getting feedback that you know what, Notre Dame would kind of like Rocco Spindler to, to win that job. And, and I, he's just stronger at the point of attack. And uh, if he can keep, keep building through the summer, I would not, let me just say, I would not be surprised if Rocco Spindler did win that job. Whereas last year we were all surprised when he won Absolutely. over Billy Shroff. Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think that's it. And we'll have more. Uh, we're going to do some uh, spring superlatives yeah. coming up a little bit later this week on uh, Irish Illustrated. But uh, for me, yeah, you exit spring, and and, and and that's the real lone question mark, I believe, for the for this football team. Maybe not the the well, it's the overarching question mark is, is how quickly this offensive line develops and how quickly this offensive line can be a playoff caliber offensive line. This should be a playoff team. This is a playoff caliber roster at every other at every other position group, and it needs to be for everyone involved a playoff caliber offensive line. There will be ample content coming from Irish Illustrated on tonight. Or tonight, it's, it's still early. This is weird finishing games. It's still early, so Saturday night, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday through the week. But we will also see you with a Monday edition of Irish Illustrated Insiders podcast. Until then, for John Bryce of FootballScoop.com. Tim Priester of Irish Illustrated. I'm Tim O'Malley. Thanks for joining us at Irish Illustrated Overtime.